we're continuing with our series called Flourish, and basically what we're doing is we're looking to um, discuss and look at the purpose of the reason why you and I are alive as individuals, and why we exist as a church. You see, it's important to ask ourselves the question, why are we here? Why do we exist? Otherwise, we can get off track and begin to lose the purposes of what God would have for us. And so we've been talking about that. This is the third week of the series. We, next week, we finish, conclude the series, and it's basically the vision of our church. And the vision, I believe, for every single person, it's basically wrapped up for those of you that are familiar with the New Testament and are familiar with uh, the Bible. It talks about basically the Great Commission. Excuse me as I adjust this. So that's what's going on. And the first week, we talked about knowing God. And that's really our objective, is to help you and, and everyone to know God. And how do you know God? You know God by following Jesus, that he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. And we are to follow him because he, the man, God became flesh and dwelt among us, and he leads us the way. We know God by following the man Jesus, who is both God and and man. And that's what we talked about that. We also spoke about last week of the importance of finding freedom. And that even though you give your life to Christ, you may be saved, you may have given your life to Christ, but it's like if you buy a house and, uh, and it's got some issues, it's got some termites, it's got some mold issues and has some weak floors or a faulty foundation, yeah, you still own it. Does it mean you're done with it? No, you want to restore it to its proper and original intent. And that's what God wants to do with us. Many people find themselves entrapped with all sorts of situations that limit the scope of what God wants to do in their life. And so part of the issues that we try to do is help people find freedom. And how do you find freedom? You find freedom by connecting to Jesus Christ and his body, which is the church. That many and most of my monuments in my life of freedom of how I've moved from one level to another has come as a result of the body of Christ working through Jesus Christ. He's the head, we're the body. And so, and we talked about we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but principalities. And if you want to catch up with that, you can go to Livestream. You can uh, actually subscribe to that. You can go back and watch previous services. We're also looking to get that up. We had a little trouble with the internet. I apologize. We're working it out. We're going to have last week's message up where we spoke about spiritual warfare. I don't want to re-preach it, but we do are in a situation of spiritual warfare, and there are situations that we have to fight against. And in January, we're going to talk about it at great, greater length and depth about finding freedom through Jesus Christ. And that's what it's all about. And God wants us to find the freedom he's created us to be. So today, I'm going to, I'm going to switch if you don't mind. I, I don't, this thing's kind of bugging me today. And I'm going to go back to this. All right, we'll continue with this until the sound person comes back. Uh, Probably had to take care of some bodily needs or something. Um, but anyhow, <laughs> we'll continue forward. I didn't mean to look and make him look bad by saying that. All right, we'll continue. Um, so today we're talking about how to make a difference, and, and, and that's next week. But this today is discover purpose. Many times you and I, what can happen is this: we lose the purpose of why we're alive. And so many people try to live a life, I, I've heard from Barner Research Group, this is a, uh, a kind of a do polls, they found out that 80%, 87% of the body of Christ, in other words, evangelical believers, do not know the reason why they exist. In other words, they know about Jesus, they know about God, but they do not understand about that. You want to try it? Testing one, two. Okay, we'll just continue with this, that's all right, we'll, we'll get it eventually. Um, this is fine, this makes a lot of noise, that's it. Uh, Spiritual warfare. Okay, let's just move on. So a lot of people don't know why they exist. They don't know why they're alive. And they think, well, I gave my life to Christ. And, and so many times they, they find, they know God, they get to know about him, and they follow Jesus, and they begin to find freedom and say, okay, I got junk I got to work out in my life. I got junk I have to work out in my life. I got to deal with this and this issue. I got so many issues that require tissues. So I'm just going to try to get do right. And what begins to happen is, is, is the following. What begins, well, that's much better. Thank you. Thank you very much. So what begins to happen is that people begin to, can you give me a moment here as I just take this off? A um, little commercial break. All right, let me just take this thing off for one second. Will you just bear with me for a moment? All right. So uh, do I need help? It's obvious I need help. I mean, it's, that's why you married me, right? 
There we go. Thank you so much. I'm free now. Uh, see, I find freedom. So anyhow, uh, so as I was saying, many people, they, they find God, they give their life to Christ, and that's an event by itself. You're already saved, and then they say, okay, we've got to find freedom. There's issues in my life. I've got strongholds. And sometimes people, they spend the rest of their life trying to find freedom, and they think because they grew up in a church, and sometimes you grow up in a church, and sometimes the Bible becomes a club. I don't mean a good club. I mean a club like banging people over the head. You need to do this. You need to do that. You need to do the other. Then God will accept you, and it's all about rules and regulations. And it's not that these things are wrong, but the way they say it, and it's all about you got to find free. And it's always about the situation. you got to start. you got to stop yourself from sinning. Stop sinning. Stop sinning. So many people try to stop sinning, and they try to avoid pain and being uncomfortable. So as a result, they spend their entire life trying to stop sinning. And then they also try not to have any pain or discomfort. My friends, if that's the way that you live your life, it's a miserable place to be. We mentioned last week that a sports team wins not by defense only, but by offense. There has to be a purpose why you are alive and what you're doing. Otherwise, you're just sitting there playing defense. I hope I don't sin today. I hope I don't sin today. I don't want any pain in my life. And just like when my situation, my wife and I, we heard this. You know, I thought to myself, I thought a lot of stuff, by the way, because I'm just a thinker, unfortunately. And I said, no matter what happens, I'm going to do what God called me to do. Nothing's going to stop that. You know, I'm going to, we're going to march forward. We're going to believe God for the best, and we're not going to let circumstances dictate to us. I'm making a decision ahead of time. No matter what happens, we're going to follow God, right? And so there's a purpose while I'm alive. I know why I'm alive. I'm alive here to serve God and help others to know about Jesus Christ and to help people to be released in their destiny and encourage people to walk in their faith, to discover why they're alive and make people, help people become self-sufficient where they can grow on their own and begin to be released in their own ministries. That's, that's the reason I'm alive. And that's why I know that's why I'm here right now. And so I have a purpose that gets me up in the morning. But there was a time I didn't know why I was alive. And, and what can happen is you and I are created for passion. You and I are created for purpose. If you don't find purpose, you start finding different purposes that don't make a difference. For example, playing black ops on the Xbox and for eight hours a day, is, you know, you, you got to find some thrill. So you try to find that. Or maybe some people get involved with partying or trying to go out and meet a bunch of people and, and do the argument. Your career can become your purpose. And, and you lose the real purpose of why you're alive. The freedom comes when you begin to know why you're alive and when you discover your purpose. And know what that does, by the way, when you discover your purpose? It helps you stay away from sin. I mentioned to you that one of the questions you asked during Easter is, how do I find my purpose? And I actually spoke a great length with that. Well, not great length, but semi-length, uh, a little while ago in September or October. And I mentioned the fact that when you have a purpose, it keeps you on track. If you know, for example, you're training for the Olympics, you're not going to eat junk food, right? You're going to take care of it. Why? I have a goal. I have a goal to be the best marathon runner in the world. I don't have time to eat Twinkies. I don't have time to eat junk food. I, I have to work out. But imagine this. I want you to do push-ups. Why? Well, because you need to be strong. For what reason? So you can be strong for Jesus. Okay, so you start doing push-ups, and you start eating gluten-free diets and no sugar and no cookies, no pumpkin pie. And you're like, why am I doing all this? There's no reason for it. You see that? Well, you want to be healthy. Healthy for what reason? But when you know that you're going to train for an Olympic athlete, then you want to get yourself in order. You have a goal, and it makes all the disciplines make sense. Do you, do you see the difference? So many times we teach people in the church, don't do this, don't do the other, uh, don't do this, don't do the other, don't, 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 and maybe, and we get the idea that God will love us more if we don't. That's not what it's about. What it's about is finding the reason why we're alive, pursuing that with everything we have. It helps give us focus so we don't get distracted with things that don't matter. I'm convinced that many people fall into alcoholism, fall into lust, adultery, and other areas in their lives because they're bored. There's no purpose in their life. They want some passion, so they'll find false passion because you and I were designed for passion, but our passion should be to do the Lord's bidding and what he's created us to be. So, 
87% of the body of Christ are stuck at number two of just trying to find freedom. That's it. But there's so much more that God has for us. You're saved already. You know you got stuff to work on, but you have not discovered your purpose. How do you discover your purpose? We're going to talk about that today. And uh, you want to make a difference. And so our, uh, our job, and next week we'll be talking about how to make a difference. You're going to find a secret next week I want to share with you. I'll give you a little heads up, is that you find fulfillment by loving and serving God. Now, it doesn't make a lot of sense saying that right off the bat. Some of you are going, it makes a lot of sense. Some of you are going, oh, no. What is he talking about? Listen, you and I were designed to live and be in communion with God. But today we're talking about how do we discover our purpose. I love what it says here. Some of you, some of you, excuse me. <clears throat> some of you are saying, well, <laughs> I have no purpose because mom and dad didn't even want to have me. I, I'm just an accident. They call me oops, but they changed my name to someone else. Oh, you guys, the first service gave me a little laugh. Okay, I'm sorry. Or maybe, you know, we had situations where Doug Wise, for example, who the marriage counselor, came to our church. His, his mother got drunk, and then she ended up getting, um, you know, taking advantage of it, and she had him. Uh, James Robertson was a product of a rape, a great preacher. And they may be illegitimate parents, but they're no illegitimate children. God has a purpose for every single human being on the face of the planet. Yes, there's sins. Yes, there's genetic problems. But there is a redemptive purpose. Everything God does, he does on purpose. For example, in the summer, I thank God every day in the summer. I thank God every day for showers. I love my shower every morning. And I also thank God for air conditioning. And what happened? People were hot. How do we get cool? I don't know. Let's try something. So they designed and they made an air conditioner for what reason? To get cool. So there was a purpose prior to making the product. Well, God has a purpose before he designed you. Let's go ahead and read the scripture. You'll see what I'm talking about. Psalm 139, verse 13. It says this. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. This is why we believe life is in the mother's womb. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. I heard the men go, yeah, I'm married to one of those. Okay. Thank That's not good. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. Listen to this. How well I know it. This is, the, this is David saying, I am wonderfully complex. I'm wonderfully made. How well I know it, that I am made in God's image. I believe he looked himself in the mirror and said, I am a child of God, and I have a purpose. David was very, very aggressive in the things of God. As a young boy, he went after the Goliaths because he knew who he was in God. Some of you don't know it very well. You don't think you actually, God cares about you. You don't even think you have a purpose. Well, I've been through three or four divorces. I had a couple of abortions. Or I, I've been involved with all kinds of sin. I got drinking and drug problems. I got all these issues in my life. I got problems with lust, and, and I, I, I just can't seem to do the right thing. And you walk around, you feel defeated, and you feel that's not the right way. And it isn't the right way. But David knew how he was fearfully and well if he made. Well, you must begin to understand, everybody, that you are made for a purpose. God designed you. Let's continue to read a scripture verse which tells it. Listen to this, verse 15. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. As I was woven together in the dark of the womb, you saw me before I was born. In other words, you weren't created by accident. There are accidental parents, but no accidental children. God will use our mistakes, if you will, but your plan, if you are alive, there's a plan for you. He said, watch me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. As I was woven together in the dark of the room, you saw me before I was born. Listen to this. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. In other words, God has a purpose and has a plan. It's like that air conditioner. I'm going to make an air conditioner because I want to cool the room. Well, God's got plans for you, and unless you do it, certain stuff is not going to happen on the earth. And the enemy's objective is to help break your purpose and make you Im immobilize you. But God has a purpose for everybody. 
Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. You know what the Bible says in Hebrews? It says that Jesus is the author and he is the completer of our faith. So it's really God's desires for you to find your will, his will for your life, more than you do. Then you ask yourself the question, then why is it so hard for me to find what God is doing in my life? I remember my early 20s struggling with this big time. What's my purpose? Why am I alive? And I didn't really, I just wouldn't, I want to do my own thing. Imagine that. <laughs> and I remember that um, I was engaged to a young lady I met in college, and we were going for premarital counseling and all that kind of stuff. I got to the pastor of the church, one of the assistant pastors. He gave us a personality test. We, he says, I've never seen a couple so far apart. You truly live on Mars, and you truly live on Venus. We have a lot of work to do. And then he looks at me and he goes, and by the way, you're called to the ministry and you're running. He pointed his finger at me and told me he knew nothing about me. And then all of a sudden, I felt in my heart, I knew God was calling, but I didn't want to do it. And so that word he spoke over me kind of began the beginning of the, well, beginning of the end of that bad section to do the right section of my life, right? And there's purpose in me, and I was holding it back. And so sometimes God will use the body of Christ, which we'll talk about in a few moments, to help you understand his will for your life. And so God is the author and the completer of our lives. But the problem is you and I want to write, hey, God, Jesus, get out of the way. I want to write my own chapter here. We should open the books of our lives and say, God, whatever you would have me to do, I want to do. And listen to him and then begin, well, as you listen, you begin to write out his story for your life. How much better is that? than us writing our own story. Hey, God, bless us, will you please? Says that. God has a purpose and desire. The good news is he wants you to discover it. Then you ask yourself the question, then why do so many people not reach their potential? Why is there 87% of the church, according to George Barner, never get past salvation and finding they got junk in their lives? They never find their purpose. And what can begin to happen is this. You start getting, you know, you start buying things, right? And now you have to pay bills. And you got this job you don't like very much. It's like Dante's Inferno. You keep pushing this boulder up every single day. And you, every day, and I, 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 now I'm stuck. I got bills to pay and mouths to feed. I can't do what I really want to do. And you hate your job, and you go through life not loathing it instead of loving it. I don't think that's God's purpose for us. There's times we have to roll up our sleeves and work hard. I'm not suggesting we don't. And we have to pay the bills and take care of people. I understand that. But God has a purpose that should motivate you to get up in the morning and say, yes, I'm going after God's purposes. He's created you for his passion. But most of us, the problem is we don't see ourselves as God sees us. We see ourselves as failures. Maybe you've been through horrible decisions. Maybe you had a, a bunch of breakups in relationships. Maybe you got issues of your past, and you still are struggling with stuff. I heard a story of a gentleman that went to a, a, a pet store, and he walked in, and he's just kind of minding his own business, walking through and trying to get some supply, and he hears, hey, you. Who, me? Yeah, you. Come over here. Goes over, and it's a little parrot in a cage. A little parrot looks at him. He goes, what do you want? He says, you're the ugliest thing I've ever seen in my life. He says, oh. He goes to the pet store owner, how dare you? Your bird was saying all kinds of bad things about me. So the owner comes over, he slaps the parrot in the beak and pulls out some feathers. And he goes, oh, sorry, oh, sorry. So a month goes by. He goes back to the pet store again. He's walking through, minding his own bit. Hey, you. What? Come over here. He walks over here. says, what? You know what. The first service was a lot more gracious. So many times, the enemy says, you know what you did. You know what. And he got this parrot. And that's what he is, by the way. He's like a little bird. He'll just kind of twerp in your ear, repeating your past failures and saying, you're unqualified to do anything for God. You just got to survive. You just got to stop doing bad things and stop and avoid having pain. That's the purpose. Of, go to church and stop having pain. Avoid sin and, and try to, to live a life where you're not getting hurt or you're not hurting anybody else. What kind of pathetic life is that? I don't want to live life like that. Do you? No. You're not designed to live a life trying to stop having pain and being a pain. You are designed for a purpose, and God has that purpose. The problem is often you and I get sidetracked by trying to be somebody else. 
So how do we find our purpose? We have to recognize that no matter what has happened in your past, it's not how you start the race. It's how you what? It's how you finish the race. And it's good to know that there's been people all through the Bible that have made a bunch of mistakes. You know what the Bible says? It says the following, Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship. I like what it says in the Living Translation. For we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the things he's planned for us long ago. Or I like what it says in the New King James as well, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in it. We are his workmanship. God has prepared things beforehand. But what happens if I miss all the stuff he did? We'll get into that in a few moments. But you do not have to listen to that parrot parroting in your ear. You're never about to anything. All right? Many people deal with inferiority. I'm not good enough because of my past. I'm so thankful for the Bible because it tells us people that really screwed up royally. For example, in the book of Joshua, there was a woman by the name of Rahab. You know what she's called? Rahab the harlot. Imagine being a name like that. I, I imagine she must be a little upset in heaven. Oh, that's Rahab the harlot. <laughs> she was a prostitute. I mean, what, what else can you say, right? And Israel was coming to Jericho, and she had faith in God. She said, I'm going to follow the God of Israel. And she gave her life to God. And as a result of that, do you know in, in uh, Joseph's lineage, which is the lineage of Christ, guess who's in that lineage? Rahab the harlot. So you think you're in, unqualified because of your past. Rahab was made qualified because of what God did in her life. And what's so amazing is there's hundreds and hundreds of millions of people that have heard her testimony through the Scripture and have been inspired. How about the woman in, in John chapter 4, the woman at the well? The woman at the well did not have well going on. She was, she was a mess. Some scholars believe she was another prostitute, a, rare, a, a, a party animal, loose woman. Jesus comes to her, and he gives her self-respect. Give me something to drink. And, she, and he, they start talking back and forth, and he, said, and he goes, well, why don't you bring your husband? He goes, well, I don't have a husband. Jesus said, yeah, you, you, you say right. You'd have five, and the one you're with right now is not your husband. Now, he, he called her out on it in love because he showed her respect. Before you can correct, you've got to connect. Jesus connected with her first, and he corrected her. And what, guess what happened? She went back to Samaria, and she was the first female evangelist. And she introduced the entire town to Jesus Christ. And guess what? Her purpose was happening, and her purpose, once again, has spoke to hundreds and hundreds of millions of people around the world because she listened to Jesus, believed his word, and she was the first female evangelist in many ways. And her testimony shows us, even with a lousy past, God can turn it around and use it for good. There's another person you might have heard of, a man that wasn't very tall, a man who was a tax collector. A man, you have to understand something here, the Israelites were under Roman domination. And so they hired these other Jewish people to collect taxes. And so if you owed, let's suppose you have $8,000 house tax on your house, he'll charge you $45,000. And if you don't like it, he, what he'll do is, oh, I can tell them about your situation. So he would take money from you. He was a scoundrel. He betrayed his own. They were hated. They were loathed. They did not love. They were loathed. They did not like them at all. And what happens to Zacchaeus? He was what? A, a wee little man. It's not in the Bible, by the way. I didn't call him a wee little man. A wee little man was he. Though he did climb a sycamore, sycamore tree if he wanted the Lord to see. And as the Savior passed him by, he looked up in the tree and said, Zacchaeus, you come down. You're coming to my house today. What happened? Jesus said, hey, listen, Zacchaeus. I want to have a relationship with you. I'm going to your house. I'm going to accept you. He accepted him. What happened? He gave all his money back and four times what he took. He said salvation has come to his house. Hundreds of millions of people have been blessed by the story of Zacchaeus. His horrible past, God changed it and made a purpose out of it. Listen, God doesn't want you to screw up and have to, hey, you can have a testimony. Your greatest testimony is not to mess up. But God will use an ex-drug addict to start a rehab center. God will use someone that had trouble with drugs to help other people get off drugs. Okay? doesn't mean that God caused it to happen. The Bible says 
And we know, Romans 8, 28, that God causes everything to work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. doesn't mean he likes all that stuff happening. It's like a GPS. Recalculating, recalculating. You may get off, well, God's redempt. God has a plan for you and a purpose while he's designed you. And the enemy tries to get you off of that plan and get you broken down so you're in a junkyard. And God will redeem you by buying you by like getting an old car and refurbishing you to the point where you can begin to be what you've called, you can come back to your design again. And that's what can begin to happen. Can I just show those slides? I didn't do it in the first service. A little more. I happen to like cars, but there was a horrible thing that took place. You can show that uh, in the Corvette Museum. Oh, they had a sinkhole in the Corvette Museum back in 2014. They had all these priceless Corvettes that literally the ground broke in, and they fell into there, and they were destroyed. Show the next one. And so this was the Mayenth Corvette designed. And I think it was a 1992 Corvette. Okay, and so imagine that. It's destroyed. Its original intent was bad, right? But what happens? We're going to restore it. We're going to rebuild it, make it stronger than it was before, better, faster. Oh, that's a $6 million man. Okay, and as a result of that, look what happened. They refurbished. Show the next one. They refurbished the car from being broken to being whole, and that's what God wants to do. He wants you to buy me a Corvette. No, I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right, that's enough of the Corvette, okay? I don't want to. That's enough. Get rid of it. Thank you. Okay, well, that's what God wants to do for us. We've fallen into a pit. We've lost our ability to be what we've called to be, and God wants to pull you out. He wants to restore you. He wants to put you together. He wants to make you whole. That's the purpose of God in your lives because he's designed us for a purpose. And the beautiful thing is, no matter what your past is, God can use it for his glory. It's like that GPS. Yeah, you got off, you know, there's a, there's a better way to get there, but you might have driven the wrong way. Recalculate it, recalculate it, recalculate it. It might take you longer to get there, but if you give your hands into the master's hands and let him control you and lead you, and like that GPS, he'll get you to that destination you're supposed to be and He'll take your mistakes, and somehow, some way, he can make something good out of it. He doesn't want those mistakes to happen. You're better off living the right life. You don't have all this collateral damage. But God can take the collateral damage and and use it for something good. You see that, everybody. That's what can happen. And this is another great thing. You need to understand something here. Before you can find your purpose, you must begin to realize that you're loved and cherished by God. This is a, one of the best verses in the Bible as far as knowing who you are. And the Bible says the following. It says, where is it? <laughs> Okay, I, I, know, I know it by uh, heart. For those who are in Christ Jesus, they are a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things, thank you, all things, anyone that's in Christ, if you're in Christ, doesn't mean you know about Christ. It means you're in Christ. It means you're remaining in Christ. If you remain in Christ, he, he is, you are a new creation. And the word creation means reborn, remade, metamorphosis. You are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Your old life, your old mistakes, your broken relationships, the habitual sins that you struggled with, all things have become new. You see, God desires to have you live a life full of living. He has designed you before the earth was created. There's a purpose and plan for you. I am having a hard time finding it. How do I find it? You find it by knowing God, by following Jesus. All right? You find freedom by connecting to Christ and his body. Because I was connected to the body, I learned I was, I was going to marry the wrong woman and go down the wrong path. Thank God I didn't marry that woman. God bless her. But I married the right woman. Amen? I went off, the, tour. I went off the, the track a little bit. But God got me back to where I belonged. Thank God I don't have much collateral damage from the, the mistakes I made. But you're a new creation. You've got to believe that, folks. You've got to believe that despite of your past and the mistakes you've made, God can redeem it. God can get you back on that repositioning and a recalculating route and make your life worth something extraordinary where you can get up in the morning and not say, oh, God, it's another day. No, God, it's another day. I want to live for you. I want to make a difference. 
When we lose passion and we lose focus, we end up falling into sin or immobile, and being immobile. Well, how do you find your purpose? We're going to conclude our time. I'm not done yet, but we've got another couple of hours to go at least. I'm just kidding with you this morning. Still this morning for one more minute. <laughs> how do I find my purpose? You find your purpose by finding, I told you, you find no God. By following Jesus, okay, the first one. You find freedom by being connected to Jesus and his body. We're not ready yet. Worship team, we will, we will be ready. Don't kick me off the stage yet. Okay, we're kind of in formal hill today. No, you, don't leave. Please. <laughs> well, how do you do that? You, discover, you need to discover your gifts. How do you discover your gifts? Know God. Follow Jesus right? Find freedom by being connected to Jesus and his body. Listen, everything that God does on the planet mostly happens through his body. Doesn't happen just, he doesn't up there and just, just blink. No, he actually uses man and woman to accomplish his goals. Why? Because we are his body. And if you're going to find freedom and a reason to be, listen, this is what happened to me. I, I didn't know I could sing. I, I mean, I, I started playing guitar, and I was in college, and in graduate school, I started playing guitar. I said, we want you to play guitar. So I started playing guitar. Hey, can you sing? Uh, the other guy can't sing today. I'm like, well, gee, I'm not Steve Perry, and I'm not Michael Bolton, because that was who I wanted. Well, I thought if I can't sing like those guys, there's no sense in me singing. If you don't know who those guys are, don't, don't look them up on Google. Stay focused here. Anyhow, so... So I started singing. Hey, you know, you know, that's pretty good. I really sense an anointing when you play. Next thing I started playing, uh, um, started playing songs. The next thing you know, I started, hey, can you lead worship to this place? I started leading worship. And as a result, I actually became a worship pastor for a while. And it all started because I was in a small group. I was playing. I found what I love to do. I love playing guitar. I love singing, right? I started doing it. And then I, people said, you know, you really have this talent and ability. Work it out. I started working it out. I got better at it to a point where I began to lead. Until Stephen came and kicked me off the platform. So, I'm just kidding. All right. So, that's, and that's a, kind of what happened. And so, you may find, you can find your way through the body of Christ, and you can start finding what you're good at and what your just gifts are. Now, how do we find our purpose? You need to discover your gifts. That's how we need to do it. Well, how do I do that? Understand that you're fearfully and wonderfully made, and there is a purpose for you. And I like what it says in Romans 12, 6. It says the following, having the gifts differing according to the grace. And the, the word grace there is charisma, where we get the word charismatic, which the word has been hijacked by the enemy. Charismatic does not mean weird. It means God's grace and ability. All right? Having different gifts according to the grace that is given, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. God gives gifts to the body of Christ. When you give your life to Christ, you get gifts. And then also there's an opportunity to ask the Holy Spirit to fill you, and you get even more gifts. For example, our dear friend, I use him as an example, David Wagner, was afraid of public speaking. And so what happened was he got, he got saved. He asked for the, um, the Holy Spirit to, to fill him up and give him spiritual gifts. He started scrubbing toilets to the glory of God. The next thing you know, he went through a Bible study. He shared some insights. Wow, this guy has good insights. He started teaching. Then he started praying for people. He started giving prophetic words. And now he's all around the world, right? It all started by beginning where he was and doing the best he can. So you discover your gifts. The Bible says we have different gifts according to the grace given to us, and that means charis. For example, I don't have grace to be a handyman. If you need anything done at your house, do not ask me to help you. I can go to Home Depot and buy you stuff, but don't ask. If I get a hammer, look out. If I part put a curtain rods up, I'm going to put holes in the drywall. And Sandra will, put, will fix it and do a better job. I'm terrible. Don't ask me to be an office manager. I'm terrible at that, too. I, I know what I'm i, I got to find my grace right? If I try to be a handyman, I'm going to be miserable. I might get a little bit better, but I'm not going to, that's not the thing what God's called me to do. He hasn't called me to be an office manager behind a desk, filing things and using uh, spreadsheets all day. God help me if I had to do that. That's not my gifting at all. So I began to find what I'm good at and began to do what I'm called to do. And that's what God wants to do for you and me. So God, God has given a desire, like it says in 1 Corinthians 14.1. 
It says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. God has given us gifts, and he wants you to follow those gifts. Well, how do you find your gifts? How do you discover? How do I start? Well, come to grips, number one, that God has a design and a purpose for you. You see, a lot of people have a lottery mentality. Let me explain what I mean by that, lottery mentality. Lottery mentality is you go into one of those convenience stores and you buy a ticket or a Powerball, whatever, and hopefully you'll win $100 million or you'll play the scratch and sniff games, whatever, they, whatever. And you're helping that you're going to just win. Our, this, it's, luck is going to fall on you. That's not the way life is. Life is not that way. You're not going to discover your purpose just by, oh, this, oh, I'm waiting for God. I'm waiting on God. No. You know how you find your purpose? Whatever your hand does, do it with all your might. Whatever you're doing, do it to the best of your ability. If you're scrubbing tall, it's like David Wagner, then scrub to the best of your ability and do it unto God. There was two gentlemen in the Bible. The, the apostles were busy with ministry. They couldn't take care of the widows. They said, hey, listen, we need somebody to help us. We need deacons, and deacons mean servants. So they got these two gentlemen by Stephen and Philip. And guess what these guys were doing? They were taking care of old ladies that were, didn't have husbands. They were serving them at the tables and stuff. That's what they were doing. <laughs> Gee, you know, I, I'm qualified. I should be speaking on a Sunday morning. I got to take care of tables? I'm going to wait until God opens the door. I'm going to wait. I'm not going to lower myself to that. But what do they do? They waited tables, and they did it to the best of their ability. And apparently they did it so well, and they did it with unto the Lord that they got promoted. You see, lucky breaks are not lucky breaks. When you work hard and you're prepared, when opportunity arrives, you're ready for it. You're not going to be ready for it if you have a lottery mentality. It's just going to come to me. It does not just come to you. You work hard where God has placed you. If you're single, then best be the best single person you can. If you're working at a menial job, then be the, if you're working at a 7-Eleven, or if you're working at a gas station, then you work at the best you can and thank God for it and be a blessing, and someone's going to promote you. God will promote you. I can trust this person. This is what I've seen happen throughout life. Don't wait for lucky breaks. You work hard where you are. Do the best you can. If it's all you're doing is, is, is shaking people's hands when you come in, do it for the glory of God. And when you do it for the glory of God, your heart changes, and God can entrust you with more. God has a purpose and a plan. And how do you start? You do whatever you're doing now. Do it to the best of your ability. Your design will reveal your destiny. We have, we have a process here at Cornerstone. We're trying, you know, we're not perfect. We're still working it out. But we're, our job as a church is to help you to be intentional, to, number one, to know God. You've got to know who God is first. Connect to, follow Jesus, right? You find freedom by connecting to Jesus and his body, and we want to help you discover your gifts. How do you discover your gifts? You discover your gifts by getting involved in the body. Well, how do you do that? We have a process called Growth Track every single month. The first week is 101, which is today. You can become a member. If you don't join this church, then join some church. Get involved someplace. Don't just come through when you get around to it. Is you come to church with a purpose. You come to church on a Sunday morning, not, oh, I just want to go. No, come. I want to make a difference in someone's life today. I want to help children to know God. I want to help someone that walks through the door and never knew who God was and, and to be nice to that person. Who knows what you do can make a difference in someone's life? Who knows that someone running the camera back there, someone, uh, we've had people literally that were watching online and then came to our church and got saved because someone was running the camera behind there. You don't know the impact you can have. And so whatever you do, do it to the best of your ability. And so we have a process. So we have membership. We get part of the membership. And then we have this another process, which would be 201, the essentials. What are the essential four things you can do to help yourself grow? Then we have something called discovery, where we give you a personality profile test. We give you a spiritual gifts test and a passion test. And then this is the part we need help with. We want to then find your passion and get you connected. That's the fourth part, is get involved with some, something in the church. All you care about is manning positions in the church. No, it's not about manning positions in the church. It's about functioning as a body. And you can start, as I started, setting up chairs, and the next thing you know, I'm an assistant pastor. This is what happened to me. I, whatever I did, I did the best I could. And I got promoted from within because I worked hard. I wasn't looking for the pulpit. I was looking to be a blessing to somebody. You see, and this is how we get promoted. 
And so that's what began. We want to help you find your gift, and we want to get, go ahead and try it. There's a, there's a couple in our church, and I use them as an example because it's pretty dramatic what happened. A couple of years ago, there was a gentleman by the name of Ken Gott, who I happen to like a lot, great guy. He came and spoke to us at our church, and we had, a, we had a breakfast meeting with some of our leaders. And while he was speaking, he looked at Kip and Shyla, and they're, they're the ones that do our youth group now. And, and by the way, they're pretty busy. He's coaching, and she's doing treasury. and They're just busy. And he looks at them and goes, God's been telling you something, and you've been saying, I don't have time. But God says, yes, you do. And they broke down and cried. I had no idea what was going on. I thought, uh-oh, they must have had a fight in the way to church or something. I hope they're okay, you know. I had no idea. That's what they talked to me. said, Pastor, we want to talk to you. And, you know, said, we think God has called us to take over the youth. I'm thinking, you're so busy. How I said, okay, we prayed about it. And guess what's happened? The youth has quadrupled, right? It's doing great. They love it. And this is what they tell me. We're tired. We drive here. It's hard to get. But when we get here, we come alive because we love these teenagers. We care about them. And it's obvious they do. And we have a wonderful couple that stands as an example of a husband and wife that our young people can look up to. And they're doing it out of the passion for Christ. And they say they enjoy it. He even said he enjoys it more than his job. He even told me that on vacation he didn't miss his job. He missed his dog and he missed the youth group. Kip and Shiloh are doing it because they're loving. Nasa and Freddie, the same thing. They have a passion to do things for kids and help kids. That's what has a passion to lead worship. You see, our passion makes a way for us. And God has a purpose for us. And how do you discover it? And isn't it amazing? As they're doing that, now God's raising them up to be ministers. And he understands that. And, and guess what's happening? His business is flourishing. What they're doing is God is blessing them because they're blessing his ministry, and he's putting them here for that reason. It's wonderful. So God has a purpose, and you need to connect to the author, and that's God. All right? Now, this is another thing I want to mention to you. The Bible says, how do you develop your gift? Your gift is never perfect. When you start doing something, you're not going to be perfect. Do not despise the days of small beginnings. The first time you try to... The first time you try to sing, you might be terrible. first time you try to play guitar or keyboard, no one's born Mozart off the bat. You're not going to write a symphony the first time you try to write something. You're not going to be the best teacher the first time you teach. You have to work it out. And then the body of Christ will say, wow, you're pretty good at that. So if God can entrust you with the small things, he can entrust you with the larger things. And sometimes the small things are the most important thing you can do. And the Bible also says in Ephesians 4, 11 through 12, I'm going to ask you can get ready, guys. And he himself, this is Jesus, Ephesians 4, 11, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying the Christ. You see, the reason why God has given different offices, we're all called to be apostles in one way, means ones of those that are sent. They're like entrepreneurs of the faith, right? You have some prophets that can hear from God, David Wagner and other people. There's people that prophesied over me, and it confirmed what God was saying, right? We have that going on. We have some evangelists. They're really good at evangelizing. We have some pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping of all of us. Our job is to equip each other to become what God has called us to be. We should be looking to complete each other, not compete with each other. Imagine that. Oh, they're better than I am. Well, try to make them better then. And then what happens if I try to make you better, you try to make me better? Which I, I, I try to bless you, you try to bless me. What happens as a result of that? It's all about giving. It's all about giving to others. So he gave himself. So use your gift. This is part of the process we want to encourage you with. Like it says in 1 Peter 4.10, God has given gifts to each of you from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Manage them well so that God's generosity can flow through you. Do you recognize that everything God does is giving? You know what the secret to living is? Giving. I hate the word consumers. I'm not a consumer. I'm a receiver. I want to receive and I want to give. When you become a consumer, it's all about consuming. It's all about me. It's all about me. It's all about me. It comes naturally because it's a fallen nature. But when you get to the point and place in your life where you receive God's blessings 
and you say, I want to bless others because God loves people, I love them. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? That whosoever believes him should not die but should be saved. That God did not come to what? Condemn the world but to save the world. How does God save the world? He said, go, all of us. We are Jesus on the planet. I don't know if you realize that. The only Jesus someone's going to see in your workplace is you. The only Jesus someone's going to see in the neighborhood is you. The only Jesus someone's going to see at the gas station is you. Wherever you are placed, you are to be Jesus where you're placed. And how we make a difference in this world is allowing God to flow through us to be his hands and his feet. And the whole purpose of God is for God so loved, he took. No, for God so loved, he gave. And if you and I want to be a people full of life, we must be a people. For Cornerstone so loved, it gave. Didn't take. It gave help. It gave help. It gave money. It gave resources. When you and I do that, when we start giving, we can start receiving more so we can give more. It's the way to live. It, it works, folks. When you try to grab and give me, give me, my name is Jimmy, you become miserable. If your name is Jimmy, I'm sorry. Well, listen, we need to wrap this up. That's real simple, folks. God has a purpose for you. He's designed you before you were even conceived in your mother's room. He had a plan for you. The trick is this. Release your control over yourself. Entrust it to God. And say, God, I want to discover my gifts. How do you discover your gifts? You know God by following Jesus, right? You discover freedom by connecting to Christ and his body. You find your purpose by discovering your purpose is by getting involved with what God has called you to do. So let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I just thank you so much for today. I thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to share your word this morning. I thank you that every single person here, here or hearing the sound of my voice or watching on video and live or later on, we want to thank you that every single person has been preordained and preplanned since the foundation of the earth. We recognize that everyone has a plan. Father, I thank you that all of us here today have an opportunity to become the people you've called us to become, to live a life full of passion, not passivity, but passion. And Lord, I ask right now that we would let go of the past and recognize that your blood is enough. I'm going to ask the ushers, please pass out the elements. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for your goodness upon our lives. God, I ask that everyone in this church would begin to find their purpose. Father, I pray that we would get connected to you, connected to each other, connected to our purpose, and that we would go and make a difference in Jesus' name. That we would discover and that we would be released in what you've called us to do in Jesus' name. With every head bowed, let me ask you a question. This does not work until you give your life to Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's the author and the completer of your faith. If you're not letting Jesus author your life, you can't discover your purpose. Also, the only way to get through God is through Jesus Christ. The Bible says this. Jesus said the following, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Have you gone through Jesus? Do you just believe in Jesus, or have you actually surrendered your life and accepted what he's done for you? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. I'm going to pray. If you'll say this prayer with your heart right now and mean it with your heart, this can be a new day of salvation for you. So you want to repeat to me in your, own, in your own heart, Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you are the Son of God. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins both known and unknown. And I declare I am no longer my own. I give my life to you today. Take my life and make it yours in Jesus' name. And with your power and with your ability, I will follow you all of my days in Jesus' name. With every head bowed, you say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer today for the first time. Anyone today or made a recommitment this morning? Anyone just quickly so I just know how to... Thank you. Anyone else this morning? You say, Pastor, can so... Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. The Bible says you acknowledge before men and acknowledge before the Father. 
I'm going to ask if we hand up. I have some elements too. I, I need to. I could use one too. Thank you. Jesus did something. You know what he did? He, he took the bread on the night when he was betrayed. He took the bread and he broke it. He did something extraordinary. He broke the bread. You know what he did? And he gave it to those at the table. Do you know what that means? He's basically telling us. He said, this is my body, which has been broken for you. And he gives it to his disciples. In other words, he's saying, you are my body. You see that? You are my body. Those who believe in Christ and give their life to Christ, we're called the body of Christ. We've been broken and we're handed out to be his body. It says in 1 Corinthians, some of you have died and even got sick because you did not discern the body of Christ. The body of Christ is not a wafer. The body of Christ are those believers that are around you right here, right now. And if you're holding unforgiveness or bitterness or resentment towards somebody. I ask you not to take communion. The Bible says those who don't discern the body correctly, some have died and gotten sick. This is serious stuff. This is the body of Christ. This is not literally the body, but this represents the spirit of the body of Christ. He broke it and he handed it to them. If you're a believer in Christ, you're part of the body of Christ. And I need to love you as I love Christ. If I don't love you, I don't love Jesus. If you don't love your brother who you do see, you can't love God who you do not see. That's for someone here this morning. So if you have a hatred or someone that's a believer, or anyone for that matter, especially a believer, the Bible says, and you can't love me. Because that's, my, that's me. That, the person you hate, that's me. That's part of my body. And so I'm going to ask you this morning, before we take this communion, if you're holding any unforgiveness in your heart, you need to release it to God. Don't take it if you're not ready to do it. It was broken for us. It was broken that Jesus, he spread his body across the world, and he was literally broken for us. His heart was broken. His emotions were broken. His body was broken, you know, through pain and discomfort. His bones weren't broken, but his body was broken. He was broken that we would be whole. Take, eat. This is my body, which has been broken for you. Father, I ask in Jesus' name for restoration of relationships in this place today. Restoration between husbands and wife. Restoration between brothers and sisters and friends. Father, we will not allow unforgiveness and bitterness to rule and to poison your body in Jesus' name. After they supped, Jesus took the wine, which represented the new covenant, the new way of doing things. What seals the deal? The seals the deal is the blood of Christ. By his wounds, we are healed. We are saved. We are delivered through that. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Take, drink. I'm going to ask you if you could stand at this point in time. We're going to conclude with one song. If you want to become a part, a member of the Cornerstone Church, I want to invite you to come to Cornerstone uh, Church 101. It's right at South's house. It's straight back. It's a little house disconnected to the left. We'll be uh, communion there in probably in another uh, 10 minutes. If you need prayer for anything, come forward. We'd love to pray with you. If you made that decision today, could you do me a favor? Could you fill this card out? Could you give it to one of the ushers or place it in one of the, the uh, receptacles? Or talk to someone today say, I prayed that prayer today, and we have a special gift for you to help you along the way, okay? God bless you guys.
the Lord bless you, may keep you. Let's walk in his purpose. Let's walk in his power. Let's be the body he's made us to be. Amen. God bless you.